My name is Larry Corey. I'm uh, from this area originally, born and reared here. Uh, went away to college and back. So uh, I came back as a result of employment. I was, uh, after graduating from college, I uh, was hired on at Fiber Industries. And um, as a result, I have been here most of my life. Uh, my uh, family is from this area. My father, grandfather, mother, all. My mother is from the city proper of Shelby. Uh, she grew up on Wilson Street. Uh, there are four of us in our family, four children. Um, she met my dad right after the war, and of course they were, they were married. We moved from Shelby to, to the farm. That's where I grew up. And the farm is actually south of Shelby, and we still hold, have that property in our family. Uh, my dad has done public work uh, here as well as farm. Uh, I have, as a result, I told you I was employed by uh, Fiber Industries. I came in as an engineer and moved up through, through the management ranks in that company. Retired about four years ago uh, after a number of different buyouts of the company, but of course I uh, have remained in the area following the, my retirement. I, have, uh, I am married. I have uh, two children, a son and a daughter. Uh, and I have a uh, grandchild, one grandchild. Uh, my uh, grandchild is here and my, my daughter's here. Uh, my son's in Rockingham, North Carolina. He's a state trooper. Okay. Congratulations on that. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about the, your, your grandparents and your, and your parents. Um, what was, talk about them and the work they did in the world that they, li that they lived in here, what they would have uh, encountered. Um, my grandfather uh, died at 101, and uh, so I knew him uh, throughout my lifetime. Uh, and again, I say we grew up on the uh, on the farm, uh, which is south of Shelby. Uh, my grandfather uh, and grandmother both were, were from the area. We had uh, the property. Uh, and the property served as, as the uh, basis of our income and that we grew cotton, we had our uh, uh, animals that we, that we used for feed, uh, for food. Uh, we had, as children, had chores and all that we had to do. Um, and the property served as that nucleus for the family because you um, it was it was sort of aired out so that uh, our my dad had his plot uh, and my aunts and so forth. So uh, as we all remained together in there, that's how we survived. My dad farmed up until uh, we got older, and of course he had to he took public work because the income was not enough to sustain our families. So he went to work for uh, the Brickyard, then to Ellis Lumber Company, uh, and my mother did domestic work. Uh, so that left the four children. I have uh, two sisters and a brother. That left the four of us there to sustain the farm and, and the family. Me being the oldest, I uh, was in charge, so I had to boss them around, you know what I mean? <laughs> to make sure that everything uh, got done. Uh, my mother um, had asthma when we were coming up, so I had to learn to do the household chores. I had to learn how to do hair. I had to cook as well as other things, and as, as we grew, those chores passed down through through the family. Um, as uh, as my father worked, you know, he he worked at uh, at jobs where in the pay was really menial. He got uh, uh, and usually he was as he worked as the work tapered off. Of course, they got less and less of it. Um, but uh, my mother as a domestic. Uh, often uh, was was carrying the family while 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 he was out of work. 
Uh, my dad is a, is a, a military person. He, he was served in the war. Uh, he was in uh, India. He was on the uh, uh, he was in the Corps of Engineers. So he drove heavy equipment, graded uh, highways, airfields, and that kind of thing. Um, and his experiences, of course, uh, at that time, speak to the, the the differences that existed. Spoke to a lot of uh, racial injustices and things like that. And while he was in the military, uh, he tells of a situation where they had just uh, were coming home. They'd been fighting a war, came in, uh, and a group of soldiers all had bonded, white and black, and they were all um, bonded. But when they got back to the states, he they went into a place. I, I think it was like a restaurant. And uh, they were all together, and they ordered food. And this is where uh, the situation really creates a lot of contrast in my mind. Here he was willing to go and, and lay his life on the line for a country, and he comes back here and could not and would not be served a Coke. He was told he could be served a fruit drink, but not a Coke. And so, of course, they all uh, left the place, all the soldiers and everything. But, but the further he got back into this country, the more the disparity was, was evident. But through all that um, and all the situations, my parents was able to uh, send four children off to college. Uh, we often tell the story. Uh, my dad had uh, three of us in college at once. All of us were on, up the interstate. I was at Livingstone and my sister was at, uh, um, she was at uh, Central and my brother was at uh, A&T. So we had, a, we had a, a, a Chevrolet. And you know, when we, when we went off to college then, we didn't have a lot of stuff like they have today. We had foot lockers. Everybody had a foot locker and most of what you, had and going off to school was contained in that footlock. So he would leave, go to Durham, and come back down the road, and we'd have footlockers stacked all on that car, the rear all packed down. But but they they were able to educate four children uh, from from his from their modest means. Uh, my dad eventually was employed. Uh, from Thomas and Howard up to um, Fiber Industries, and 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 going to Fiber Industries, that's when uh, our uh, financial situation was much more stable because they had a higher p wage rate and all this other stuff. Um, as it relates to to me and my family, uh, I'll start with the youngest. My brother went into the military out of college and uh, was a retired uh, major. Um, I have a sister that is uh, currently employed by Cleveland County. I have one that's also a teacher uh, and is employed by Cleveland County. And then I went into industry and worked my way up through, through industry. Um, my uh, involvement here in the community uh, goes way back if, if I can say such. Um, and it was probably the results of something that I think uh, Jean Legrand saw. Um, of course, Jean hired me as an engineer. And then he, I think he kind of coached me and nur nurtured me around the idea of community service and community sensitivities. And um, so as a result, I have been involved in the community was elected as a school board person some time ago, uh, served on the hospital board and directors and later chaired that group. Um, but through all of that, there is uh, the change that has occurred in the county. And um, when you think about the change that has occurred in the county, I, I as as a professional person coming back into coming back home, um, 
there were some things that was quite shocking. One of which was that uh, here you go off and you get a professional job, uh, you're, you're coming in, you can't get a loan. Uh, folks looked at, uh, at, at me as a professional as, okay, this is just a coincidental thing. Yet, uh, others were getting loans and this kind of stuff, and my pay was as good as theirs. So, so in contrasting that today, there is opportunity that is, uh, that's available in this community. I want to put your, uh, your long-lived granddad in the picture in terms of if you guys lived close together physically and you were taking over chores from your parents who were going to work out of the house and off the land, um, what was your, your grandparents' role at that point? How did you, did you have daily contact with them in turn? Yes, I, I did have daily contact with Grandpa. And uh, daily uh, activities such that Grandpa passed on a lot of things that uh, I call upon today. First was a strong work ethic. Uh, Grandpa believed up before dawn <laughs> and, and go to dark. Uh, he was a provider. Grandpa did not have a formal education, but he knew how to uh, relate to numbers. He, he taught us uh, about what a bushel is and that kind of thing. Um, he coached us on things about life. Um, he believed that humility was a, was a strong suit, not a liability. Uh, that others should speak of you, not yourself. Um, and that um, judge a person on their own, not because of color or whatever, but judge them on their own. And you will know after you interface with them where to put them, okay? And so with that belief, uh, as we've gone forward, that's been sort of the mantle we have chosen to, to look at it that way. Now, Grandpa, lived, we lived on 18. Uh, we were self -sustain, a self-sustaining unit, but he also believed in caring for others. So the poem, House by the Side of the Road, is really what his place turned out to be. Uh, people would come through needing some food or whatever. We always had meat in the, in the smokehouse. We always had fruit in the cellar. We always had stuff under the uh, potatoes in the, in the sand pile and all. And so folks who needed stuff would come to Lon's, Grandpa was named Lon, and uh, he, would, he would take care of them. When we had uh, hog killing times, uh, folks who needed, he'd say, come on in and help us. If you help us, you get a cut of the meat, and that kind of thing. So uh, we had an orchard, a full-blown orchard, so we went through the process of drying fruit and all that kind of thing all of which was geared toward taking care of, 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 of his family and us, as well as others who needed it. Uh, he was always strong in the faith. Um, while, while Grandpa didn't always uh, tend to espouse a lot of uh, scripture, he lived by the scripture. Uh, and I think that is uh, something that is also in our family as a result of Grandpa. Um, Grandpa was a very patient man. He had all these boys around him, and he knew how to manage us boys. Uh, not necessarily physical, but by insightful discussions and that kind of stuff, and, and um, Lon took care of his boys. Granny, on the other hand, was uh, also a nurturer. She looked after us, and, and the younger you were, the, the closer you were to Granny. The older you got, the further you got away from Granny. And, uh, but they, they really, they really um, helped us. Now, we had family. Uh, he had family that was actually moved away. They uh, would come back in, during the summer times, and, and we would have all kinds of things going on. Uh, we used to, as, as children, uh, since we owned the, the place, we had creeks, so we'd go fishing in the creeks. We'd pick blackberries and all those kind of things. Um, 
He's also a believer in education. So um, Grandpa said back, way back, uh, there used to be local uh, school committees and Grandpa was on the school committee. So that what they would do is, is, is since the schools were separate, uh, difference in funding, this committee would go and actually help at the school, work on the school, and do whatever else is needed. So he was on that committee. And we lived about uh, less than a mile from the school, so we walked to school every day. Uh, we, were in, we were in a zone where the bus couldn't pick up, but we walked. So rain or shine, we were there. Uh, we also had split sessions. Split sessions meant that you would go to school when you were not farming. And so when you pick cotton picking time come, school would either go to a half day or out in total. So, but ordinarily during that time, we were expected to be in school. Uh, foundationally, we always had to respect the teachers. And, and my mother said, if the teacher got you, you were gonna get it at home. So we would go, they would interface with the school uh, to keep up with what we were doing. Quite a picture you painted, a really vivid picture of your life. Now it strikes, strikes me that you were you were participating in a uh, a lifestyle that was pre twentieth century. I mean, that hadn't changed in many many years. And through through seeing what how your grandfather lived and participating in it, mm -hmm. and here you are in twenty first century Cleveland County. But mm -hmm. what a perspective on on the evolution of this uh, this area. Mm -hmm. Um, could you just address that span of time, you know, what, what that span of time and change has, has meant to you? And where do you think the, uh, how far, you know, what the fundamental underlying changes have really been? Um, that's, a, that's a very broad question, yeah, but, is, I, but uh, <laughs> uh, there is a dichotomy. There is a dichotomy, and I'll, I'll try to address it from that standpoint. Uh, Starting with my grandfather. My grandfather was a, uh, started as a sharecropper and ultimately owned his own place. He went from that to the board of directors for the Farmers Home Administration, okay? And that, that in itself speaks to the change. I went from uh, the cotton patch, growing up in the cotton patch, to college to chairman of, Cle of one of the largest institutions in the county, the board of, of on the hospital, speaking to the dichotomy. We had, well, there, were, there were those who grew up with us, again in the, in the agrarian area, went off to become doctors. There are those who, who were also involved in this that left and went from, again, the agrarian uh, activities to college professors. Okay, so that speaks to the, the the change. We have gone from absolutely no political uh, uh, involvement here in this community to heavy political involvement. We've gone from um, uh, the the community based our uh, different school systems to one school system uh, with, uh, with, with diverse representation and administration of those school systems. So there's been a, there's been a lot of change, but yet there's still a lot to do. Uh, uh, if you think of it in, in, in terms of our community, our, the Afro-American community here is underrepresented when it comes to wealth. The, the whole process that, has, that we've gone through has essentially left Afro-Americans not having, not wielding a lot of wealth in this community. And as a result, oftentimes certain decisions may be made and we're not at the table, okay? So what is needed is we got to figure out how to nurture small businesses such that there is in fact wealth transfer. And I believe that when you, when you get wealth transfer, you can help the underserved because there's a difference in perspective. There are more foundations created and a lot of things in the result, underserved get more help. We've got that to do in this community and I think that's a very important uh, piece for us now. 
Um, I also feel that uh, as we look back at it, um, we've got to be really honest about telling the story as it actually happened. Too many of our children are unconnected to the struggle. They're, they're hearing uh, the, the rap stuff that's, that's, that's here and now, but do, don't have any connection to the things that, that, that my grandfather experienced, my dad experienced, I've experienced, and others. That's important. That's a very important lesson because it teaches us about uh, patience. It teaches us about loving our fellow man, and it teaches us about tenacity. In your experience, uh, has music been a vehicle for people to, uh, either your family or African Americans in the area, to just express what was going on or, you know, feel their own stories coming back, maybe locally or over the, even over the radio in the, in the 60s? Just, I'd love to hear your take on, on how music has either uh, made it easier or r rallied people or taught, or taught a lesson, just as you have alluded to hip-hop now and how it's missing an opportunity to teach. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, music has been a, uh, or is, a key part of our culture, and uh, music uh, has, been, has been the vehicle oftentimes to uh, convey the depth of the struggle. Uh, for example, it, when, when, when someone sings, uh, Precious Lord, Take My Hand, and seeing that with the, uh, with the, when they make the connection to their soul, you feel it. And it's been, uh, and when someone sings a song about romance or love, and it touches, you feel it. And and, I think, it's been that, if I can use the term, that silent vehicle to communicate what's really going on, where you are, where we are, regardless of whether it's country, western, soul, or whatever, it tells of that. Um, oftentimes in, in church, um, the music kind of conveyed the rhythm of society. When things were going good, you would hear joyous songs. When things were really going bad uh, and difficult, uh, it was also reflected in the music. And so while it was relating to us uh, and we're using it to relate to others, it's been key. Uh, for example, one of the things that when we were in school, music played a key role because we started out with things like rhythm, <laughs> rhythm bands, playing flutes, uh, going to competition, and uh, glee clubs. We had competition in the glee clubs, and that was a key, key, key connection to, to our, within our community. The, 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 the high schools would, would have these music festivals. Uh, I call them festivals now, but they were actually music competition. We were, um, we had the opportunity to go to the symphony. North Carolina had a symphony program where the symphony would come to the community. We would be bused to, 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 to the symphony. Uh, so we got a, a variety of music as we were coming up. Uh, and I think where we have got to take advantage of is, is something like the Earl's Growth Center is going to create greater appreciation for all types of music. Um, the, the, the country western style that uh, Earl played, um, bluegrass style that he played, still resonates be with, with, with folks. Um, and the, the, the ability to, to string the banjo with the depth and quality he's, he's, he had, uh, he has, is uh, something that, that we'll all appreciate. So the Earl Scruggs Center, I think, is going to be a good way of telling story about music in general. Um, and, and no one culture has the, um, an opinion I have, is no one culture has the, uh, the right to, to claim all the value of music. It's, it's something that's common to human and everyone. 
in my opinion. And it's just different. It's mm -hmm. different, but we can all relate to it. I know in my heart you're right about that. Okay. What about the uh, bluegrass music? As much as I love it, one of the things that's, that's com complex about it is that it has never really even tried, to, to, to my knowledge, and I'm, I'm on the board of the IBMA and we, we talk about this, but it, uh, it is a very wide audience. And only recently at Merle Fest or you know, some of the festivals in some of the bigger cities out west do you start to see uh, black families uh, showing up. And I imagine that the word bluegrass may even have some uh, emotional complexities for you. And did, what's your take on what bluegrass music has been and why is it so white? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, bluegrass music and um, bluegrass uh, country western music has had certain connotations when it comes to Afro American, Afro Americans, in that some of the more um, uh, unpleasant things that we talk about in terms of uh, clan activities and night riders and all that other stuff have somehow had made a connection to that type of music. So when you hear it and you you hear it, what thoughts do you have? Okay. Uh, so, so what we've got to do is get the story out that, again, going back to my grandfather, we have to gauge based on the person, not necessarily that, that very negative memory. And um, so we've got a job to do. Uh, country, western, bluegrass music um, has a story. It has a feeling. Uh, different than one that I feel, but it has all of that. And when you take uh, a banjo and you learn how a person gets gifted in it, it is, and, and that full story is told where an Afro-American sat with him who brings the banjo forward from Africa and that connectivity, and he learns to get his licks in on that music uh, it's something that's got to be told. Because, uh, you know, when we were growing up, there were community bands. I, it was a little ahead of me. But my grandfather was in a community band, and he had a banjo, and he had a trombone. And he, th they would go to and, and doing their thing would be at somebody's house licking and blowing. You know what I'm saying? And that was... Uh, so, so music has been there all the time. And when we were growing up, the music we heard, because there we had no other source of music, over the airways was country western, bluegrass. So, um, so we heard it. We listened to it. But then we would, as we would try it late at night, go to Ernie's radio, Ernie, Ernie, I can't even think of a name, but Ernie's, we'd, 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 when, the, when the signals got right, you could flip around and find Ernie coming out of Tennessee. And that's where we picked up on a lot of soul, blues, and so forth. Was it WLAC, do you think? Was that the, was that the call letters? Randy's Record Shop. Randy's Record Shop. Randy's Record Shop. That's yeah. it, yeah. And... Um, but uh, we had uh, folks who would, who could, who could play those those instruments and all. Yeah, yeah. No, that's fantastic. I'm really glad I asked about that. I wanted to know on a different subject uh, how the uh, the bull weevil and the decline, the slow decline of the cotton business, the textile business, has affected your family and, and your sense of the theme. Uh, the uh, bull weevil um, that. Era is, is sort of ahead of me, but what I can recall when we were growing up, we had to fight the boll weevil. We used a DDT. Uh, we had dusting and spraying and going on about every seven days. You were dusting and spraying to 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 fight the boll weevil. Uh, and it's a wonder we're all alive as much DDT as we used back then. But I'll tell this story quickly. When when you sprayed when you dusted cotton. Whichever direction that dust went in, there was nothing left. There was no insects. If it went through the barn, all the flies were gone. 
But um, over time, as we uh, grew, the dependency on cotton diminished because we were moving out to more public work. Uh, the size of the operation, and as you had allotments and those kind of things that were set up by the government to, to uh, maintain pricing of cotton, our size and our, our size operation diminished, went down. But it was a combination of, of, of boll weevil conforming to the allotment process that was out there um, and so on. But, but by and large, uh, cotton was the key economic engine for our small farm. As we got older, we shifted from cotton to uh, grain, uh, soybeans, and uh, wheat. Uh, so that's... All right. Okay. It must be Melanie. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Are you on a break? Chase has got leave, but... but the, the organizations you work with, and, and um, I believe you do you work with kids, too? Uh, you have a, so describe that, and, you know... Are they looking forward to a future here? Do they talk about staying and improving on this place and, and building on it? Right. Uh, there's a group of us that we call ourselves a core group. This is a group of, uh, I call them movers and shakers. And uh, our intent is to attempt to close disparate gaps, especially those in education. We have looked at the numbers and we say that uh, uh, Afro-American children have been underperforming for years. And our goal, working with the school system in the county, is to recognize that, acknowledge that it exists, and let it, us as a community take ownership for some part of resolving that, okay? And so over the, over the we've been at this now for 10 years. So we ha it's, it's structured such that we have education summits, we have uh, uh, efforts going on in the schools to get children in advanced placement classes. Uh, we have uh, what we're calling a Distinguished Image Awards activity. Um, and we are, uh, have recently started what we're calling a Math Academy, all of which are based on the numbers. And the Math Academy focus is that we will take children given passed to us by the school system who say that they need help in math and we put them in a three-week uh, academy using uh, teachers we have a principal we have a community that has come together such that we provide transportation and each child gets a scholarship of two hundred and fifty dollars and, and at the end of the three weeks, we have a graduation ac activity. We started this three years ago. Although it has, it has been part of our dream for a number of years, we started it three years ago. And we're now in the third year. We have uh, 260 children now that we've covered in this math academy. 60 the first two, 60 first year, 60 to second year, and this year we have 100 enrolled. And we have, uh, it is for uh, fourth, fifth, rising fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. And we developed a, a, uh, uh, a third grade academy as part of this. So we have two campuses now, third graders and fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. I, I, I go through that to say, we have a set of beliefs that we developed associated with this, and our partners, which include the school system, the churches, and all, are buying into those, in that we celebrate the successes of our children. We de-label our children. And when we go, and, and we set a foundation of, if you're going to interface in this math academy, you have to do it a certain way and that you must carry these same basic beliefs into the child where the child feels it. And what we're sensing as a result of that is the process of positive reinforcement is giving children a different outlook. You, 
a, a child that has had issues with math coming to the math academy and today I witnessed them raising their hands, engaging in the process of learning math, gives them possibilities and outlook. They have the opportunity to take part of this American dream. So with that, one of our goals and our prayer is, is that we take, we have children who see the possibility, feel the possibility, and are willing to actualize on the reality that they can be successful here, okay? And, and we, we do that with the passion. So on our belief is there are no excuses. We, we, we have no excuses. We are very aggressive. Everybody in the core group is, is I say, movers and shakers, and we take no prisoners. All that we do is for the child. We place the child in the center of what we do, and that's where we're focusing. So a component piece of this is the parent. Not only are we working with the, the, the children, we have a requirement that all parents whose child have re, or guardian who received this, this scholarship must come to a, a parent session one night a week. And in that parent session, we talk about how to interface with the school, where the resources are available to help your, your child in learning. Uh, and we, of late, have helped parents set up email addresses so that they can contact their teacher. Today's technology, it, understanding today's technology and, and taking advantage of that is one, is one basic requirement. And too often we find parents are not really linked into that. Our teachers are sending emails and they're going nowhere and so forth and so on. But um, th this has been a really uh, rewarding experience for us in a community. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean as far as the outlook is concerned for our county and for our community? That we have the capacity to first own our problems and secondly do something about them. Because if we if we are we are we're doing this math academy without a single grant, it this is this comes from the capacity within our community. We 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 are so blessed. We, even though we have high unemployment, when you look back, we are so blessed that we can in fact do more of these kind of things. An example, you let Cress and Shelby play football. The revenue from that game is probably $35,000. And it's just for two hours worth of entertainment. Yet we have children who, who are underperforming in schools and it's up to us to do something about that. I'm not taking anything away from athletics. If you're into that, that's fine. But we must also balance the scale to where there is academics and athletics are on parity. Okay, I didn't mean to get so so compassion so passionate about that, but that, that's what we believe. And uh, so the outlook for our community is that if we can choose where we want to come together and make a difference, we can, and we will.